Now you want to come over. Look at that. Look at, look at the intensity. <laughs> Anytime you're in, Billy, get out of the way. Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and, and friends of Baylor. Got to step over Lily. She's in the way. So interesting uh, information this week because there is, uh, as, as you know, as we talked about, a lot of times uh, the determination of what's in the flu vaccine is based on what happens in the Southern Hemisphere. So some Canadian investigators were looking at what happened in the Southern Hemisphere and uh, it's a little different when, from what everybody anticipated. Last year, H1N1 was the major dominant strain. Later on in the season, uh, H3N2 emerged. So what's happening in the Southern Hemisphere is that it, at the end of the season uh, is with H3N2. And there has been a slight drift of the genetic material, in other words, a number of mutations, so that it's not exactly the, matching the, what's in the vaccine this year. So this mismatch means that it will likely have more cases of flu. Uh, but if you look at the, the drift, it's so small that it, it probably won't have any impact on uh, the virulence or you know, how, how sick people get, and it will not be impacted uh, in, in terms of being resistant to, to antivirals. So I do think this year, just because it's different from, it's not an exact match to what's in the flu vaccine, it is likely that we'll have uh, more cases. Now, there's some early positive data from the UK uh, and they looked at uh, what's in the vaccine and effectiveness based on what's circulating around, and it's 70 to 75 percent effective in preventing hospitalizations for children between 2 and 17 years old, but it's only 30 to 40 percent effective in adults. So I, I think all things being equal, based on the fact that this year we're going to have a slight mismatch between the vaccine and what's actually circulating, I think we'll have a, a more flu cases than usual. Now, if you look at the CDC is finally releasing new data, 2% increase in clinical positivity for influenza, and uh, the most frequent one is H3N2. What is in the uh, vaccine is H1N1, which was the dominant variety last year, H3N2 of the clade K, which is different from the clade J, which is that, and then of course the B Victoria. So that's what's going on in flu. Some interesting developments in bird flu. So we haven't had a case of a in person infected for a while, but a patient uh, from Grays Harbor uh, in Washington has been confirmed to have an influenza H5N5. This is the first uh, new case in nine months, and interestingly, it's a different variety. So H5, instead of H5N1, it's H5N5. This has not been previously reported in humans. That's why it's a little bit concerning. The person had a mixed uh, flock of uh, domestic poultry and wild birds in the back, and that's, uh, that's why uh, they, they were infected. Now, of course, when I heard that it was from, from uh, Grays Harbor, I had no idea where Grays Harbor was. So this is where Grays Harbor is. It's that inlet in Washington, and it's named after Captain Robert Gray, who between 1790 and 70, 1793 pioneered the American maritime fur trade. So. And if you see, you know, why is this happening in Washington and California? If you look, the major North American Pacific Flyway goes right down through Washington and California. So if you look at the number of cases of bird flu, look, it's mostly on the West Coast. It's all over, but mostly on the West Coast. And you can see that's the major Pacific Flyway. Now that there, there are 41 dairy cattle herds that are infected, 24 poultry farms. So it's really busy. Now, another disturbing thing in the world of mammals is the southern elephant seals. These are, these are the largest seals uh, known uh, that are around. H5N1, or one of the uh, bird flu varieties, has now gotten all the way down uh, to South Georgia. And South Georgia is way there in the middle of the South Atlantic, near the Falkland Islands, or including the Falkland Islands. And there are three major breeding grounds, uh, breeding colonies that are in uh, southern South Georgia. And unfortunately, uh, when, they, when they get infected, it has a big impact on the seals. So in 2023, H5N1 spread to the South Georgia Islands. It has the largest colony of, of uh, elephant seals. The three uh, beaches here where most of them are breeding and the population of females is down by 50%. So when they look at what the, the genetic analysis of the virus, and it looks like it's, it was uh, coming from wild migratory birds from South America, 
And the interesting thing about it and the disturbing thing about it is this particular virus, this particular bird flu virus, has a specific adaptation that allows it to infect, infect mammals. And so it's a big problem. Now, th this is why we, we get concerned about a potential outbreak in humans, is because every time a bird flu enters another species, uh, especially mammal species, it makes it seem like the, the flu can adapt to humans. And so the, obviously the concern is another pandemic with H5N1. And so the only way to be, to be prepared for that is to have a vaccine stock. And so there's a lot of work going on in vaccines. There was a paper in Nature Communication that was really interesting. It's a phase one trial looking at intranasal vaccine for H5N1 and multiple clades of H5N1. And it also then followed with an IM booster. And why do that? Remember, if it's nasal, intranasal, you end up generating a mucosal immune response, mostly IgA. If you're injected uh, in mu intramuscularly, it's IgG. That prevents uh, systemic kind of spread of the virus, but it doesn't prevent transmission like in your nose and, and getting infected. Saw the same thing with COVID. Uh, it, you know, the, the vaccine is very effective at preventing serious illness, but it doesn't prevent you from actually being infected, especially in your upper airways. So this is a very important trial. They thought, tried three different doses. And the good thing is there was showed that each of the p p people who got this nasal vaccine and a booster had a very strong immune response. And the great thing is it's shelf stable. You can have it ready. And so this is the way we can prepare for what could eventually be a pandemic with bird flu. You know, I'm always <laughs> sick. I'm sick of measles. Well, measles is still going. Uh, there's been 42 cases in the past week. There are now over 1,700 cases. 87% of these cases are associated with outbreaks. Outbreaks are three or more cases. And the reason they, they, this is our, our national vaccine rate is way too low. And so what happens is anytime there's an introduction of a person with measles, if you're not maximally vaccinated above 95%, you're going to have an outbreak. And so we keep having outbreaks. There have been 45 outbreaks in 2025. 92% of those people are unvaccinated. Only 4% have had two, both doses of measles vaccine. Hot spots right now are in Utah and Arizona, but we're going to continue to see this. I mean, it's a real shame considering that we eliminated, we eliminated measles in 2000. Uh, this is another, just a couple of interesting articles that came up. This is a paper from Nature Aging, which looked at um, people who are multilingual and, and looked at their de cognitive decline over time, and it turns out if you only know one language compared to people who know two, three, or more languages, your cognitive decline is faster. So luckily, I've, I, I have three different uh, languages. I speak uh, Cleveland, Ohio, English, Northeast English, and I can also do Texas English. So I'm, I have enough. I'm multilingual. <laughs> in, in the, so I'm going to live forever. And of course, then there, we, we had that uh, uh, paper in Cell of, about a year ago that looked at uh, DNA uh, isolated from the woolly mammoth. Well, here's the woolly mammoth that is now 40,000 years ago, and they're able to isolate RNA from this. And they are, it was interesting. There's more of a technical tutor for us that they were able to isolate RNA. But in this particular case, they looked at the expression patterns of the RNA, and it looked like the woolly mammoth was under stress, like it was running from a predator and had bite marks on its leg. So I don't know. It was an interesting paper. Okay. One other thing I wanted to mention uh, for, for those of us who have domestic animals, uh, there is a bunch of studies now showing that obesity and metabolic syndrome is now passing on to all kind of domestic animals too. 50 to 60% of domestic cats and dogs are overweight. Lily, are you overweight? She's keeping her girl, her, her little girl figure. Uh, and anyway, so it's a real problem and uh, with diabetes in, 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 in cats, although, you know, who cares really about cats? Okay, uh, I want to end, well, some people care about cats, I don't know. Okay. I'd like to apologize to all the viewers who have cats. Of course we care about cats. I don't, but, you know, some people do. Okay, so the, I want to end with the TEFI data because it's really interesting. As you know, the Texas Epidemic Public Health Institute where we follow uh, wastewater analysis of all the different viruses that are in, in wastewater because huge, big, huge increases in adenovirus uh, B, enterovirus 68, these are all major upper respiratory viruses, and norovirus, which is a GI virus. Interesting enough, uh, enough very little SARS-CoV-2 right now. And of course, MPOX is still in Houston and Austin.
Who's surprised by that? Nobody. Okay. I want to end today with a bunch of shout outs. First of all, congratulations to Dr. Don Donovan, professor and chair of the Bobby Alford Department of Otolaryngology, who received the Texas Association of Otolaryngology's Lifetime Achievement Award. So that's people who have had a profound impact on their field. So congratulations to Dr. Donovan. Also, again, another one, Dr. Christy Ballantyne, professor of medicine and chief of cardiology and cardiovascular research, was named a 2025 Distinguished Scientist by the American Heart Association. This honor recognizes his decades of influential research in lipids, inflammation, atherosclerosis. Uh, really terrific uh, scientist and, and cardiologist. And finally, uh, congratulations to Dr. Mona, Monica Gramages, Professor of Pediatrics, and Dr. Lisa Forbes Satter, Associate Professor of Peds, Chief of Allergy and Immunology, who are among 92 members elected to the American Pediatric Society. The APS is a, a, an honorific society that recognizes uh, leaders in, in pediatrics and child and adolescent care. So congratulations to all of those faculty members, and I wanted to just say, have a happy weekend, and I can't wait to see you next week. <laughs>